Okay, there. Help Hello, me. everybody. No, um, don't start. I'm not out. All right, you. There you go. Ah. All right, so hey, everybody. Hello. My name is Andrew. I'm Sam. And uh, we are celebrating All Hallows Eve, my favorite holiday, Halloween, all month of October, reviewing a movie a day, but not just any movie. We're yeah. going to be reviewing horror movies because yes. horror movies that are crap. They're the shit. I love them a lot. And October is <laughs> the perfect event. A holiday that celebrates people who speak weirdly. Yes, apparently. yes. We're absolutely. really getting into the swing of it here. And today's picture is Rosemary's Baby, a very seminal horror flick. Good uh, word. The argument could be made that it's the first new Hollywood picture. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Yes, we will. But um, it's certainly a good place to start for mm -hmm. a month of horror movie. It is. It really is because uh, you're right. It is one of the first seminal movies of that new period. 1968. Don't reuse the word seminal. That was my that word. That was your... Uh, Alright, I'm going to have to think of a, a new A-list word. Alright, but check this out. So this movie came to Robert Evans through William Castle, who made B-movie schlock forever. Yes. And he wants to direct it. He's a very seminal B-movie producer. Lots you of... can't be seminal B movie producers because B movie producers never create anything seminal. That's why they they're B movie producers. No, can't... Castle made a lot of interesting pictures that used a lot of weird technologies, like pumping smoke into theaters. He's very well known yeah. for producing the kind of uh, schlock, to put an unkind word on it, that guys like John Carpenter and Roger Corman were very influenced by. Right. And uh, he was also fairly instrumental in coming up with a distribution platform that like tiny you know, sort of crappy movies could get where you'd release one movie, you know, in one city and you'd see how it did and you'd Travel tweak it, it and, you know, make changes to the advertising or cut it before you move it to the next little city in the Midwest. And uh, a very interesting guy. Yeah. And he actually makes an appearance in the movie at some yeah, point. Yeah, he's in the phone booth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When and she calls. Actually, this is interesting. William Castle wanted very badly to direct this movie. And uh, Evans, who was the head of production of Paramount at the time, uh, only recently the head, and he was having a lot of trouble with the, the studio higher-ups. Uh, he hadn't had a, a qualified hit yet. Uh, just could not bring himself to give something this good to William Castle, so he insisted that Castle could produce it if he was allowed to bring on Roman Polanski, right. who at the time had never made an American picture. So. But he did make a huge splash in Europe with uh, Repulsion, Fearless Vampire Killers, Knife, Knife in, in the Water. Water, other movies about unpleasant people <laughs> who do terrible <laughs> who things do to terrible each other. Things. Uh, essentially, reading the book, reading the script, you understand exactly why they yeah. get this guy to do it. And uh, Robert Evans really, it's, it's fundamental to realize how influential what he did rippled through the, uh, how it rippled through the effects of Hollywood through yeah. the 70s. And it's not just that, you know, they've created some of the most audacious, interesting movies in American cinema, but they did have that kind of pattern of taking B-level material, or what they think sells as B-level material, and giving it an A-level treatment. We saw this with Jaws. Uh, we saw this with even The Godfather. They well, thought yeah, it was going to be it's, a schlocky. It's funny. This is uh, one of the first sort of 70s new American you know, Hollywood director of pictures, which treated basically the genre conventions of a, you know, much less important movie as a real picture and brought some gravitas to it. Right. So uh, let's actually get into the movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Polanski directed this. He has a very uniquely negative worldview of human nature. Uh, you know, his family was killed by the Holocaust. Uh, you know, it's it's Sharon fairly Tate, heavy. His wife, Sharon Tate, was, uh, was murdered. Was murdered later. Yeah, that, that came is, later. That is actually, although, this is interesting, he really wanted Sharon Tate to play the for title role. the role of Rosemary. Uh, and Polanski said that when he read the book, he saw this sort of, you know, milk-fed, voluptuous, American, you know, Midwestern female and when Mia Farrow came to audition, and I think she was really only a TV actress at the time, she was known for uh, some TV she did, show. She recently did a movie, history. right, right. But she was well known amongst the you know celebrity culture because she was married to yeah. uh, Frank Sinatra. She was at married the to time. Frank Sinatra at and the time and divorced him during filming. And divorced him very notably during right. filming because she wouldn't leave the production, which ran very much over schedule, to go join him on a picture he was making called The Detective. Um, one of those had a lasting appeal. One of those <laughs> has had a lasting appeal. You probably could not find the detective now if you really <laughs> searched for it. But um, 
So the getting movie into is, the movie, yeah. it opens up on this amazing shot of New York, uh, the Bramford uh, apartment building, which is actually a, a building in New York called the Dakota, mm -hmm. which John Lennon was living in when he was shot. Yeah. So Parking it's on. like, oh, it's got a bummer history. You know, it's it's totally not true. It's just a building that very rich people live in. Um, oh, no, 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 no. Unemployed actors also live uh, well, in Well, that's it. the other thing. Watching this movie, I, it, it feels very timeless, except right. for the size of these apartments is like you've never seen horror pictures and rent control <laughs> married this uniquely. The in a cast picture. of Friends were it, probably like, oh my what the God, hell is this that? makes Friends look yeah. like the HBO show Girls. It's yeah. unbelievable yeah. how huge these apartments are. And this is a mid 20 something year old married to a struggling actor. Right. But you know, let's it's, get into it's I, ridiculous. One of let's my, get into my favorite things about about that dichotomy is John Cassavetes playing the husband. And the husband, Rosemary Husband in the movie Guy is played by the actor Amazing director actor, actor. John Cassavetes. What's Woman particularly under the influence? Yeah. It's other particularly pictures, amazing Chinese because Bucky. in 1968, I would consider this one of the most mannered films I've ever seen. And mannered in, in the degree that everything is precisely the way that Roman, Roman Polanski wanted it to be. Every camera angle, I'm sure he did a million takes for everything. Very mannered. All the dialogue, very mannered. The same I year... I see where you're going with this. The same year John Cassavetti came out with his really big debut in Faces. Yeah. Which is... Cassavetti's style is completely the furthest thing from anything mannered. It's completely... Loosely improvis improvisational, the camera's all over the place. It's very see the pants, and the fact that they work together, whether it was the fact that they work together very barely. Apparently, yeah. they had a lot of trouble with each right. other on set, exactly because of that Cassavetes was very improvisational, very loose. And although they apparently really got along, that's uh, the great thing about Mia Farrow has a story about. Uh, uh, Yamaha, which is mentioned in the picture, gave them both motorcycles, and they would pal around and you know screw around New York on these. A lot things. of alpha male activities. Yeah, a lot of yeah. very like alpha guy. And then as the shoot progressed, they really went at each other apparently. And you can, you can tell there is like a, a base level of irritation and anger from right. his character during the whole movie, and his <laughs> performance really I is, love it. is perfect along with Barrows, who is in almost every shot of, yeah. of the movie. And it's it, unbelievable how good she is. She's in this, fantastic. In this picture. And it's really particularly I, I love him and as that character because he is such an alpha male and she is so fragile. Yeah. And he really there's this whole sense throughout the whole picture. I mean a lot of undertones about women's liberation and I it, during that time it, the thing that amazed me most about the film, the the moment that I had the biggest like dramatic, I guess, emotional feeling was uh, when the doctor, Charles Grodin, this was his first big movie. He, you know, subsequently went on to do great, a number of great movies like Midnight Run. People start portraying Rosemary one by one, yeah. right? And it's come, it's almost come to expect that, like, the paternal neighbors played brilliantly. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the husband played brilliantly. People that you would assume are gonna kind of portray this woman. The doctor... Yeah. When he turns on her, that's the biggest mm -hmm. shock to me. Yeah. Because it almost could be, I, you could almost read this as a subtext on women's choice, on 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 the, the, the ownership women have to their bodies. If you manage to make this movie even heavier than it is during this review, I'll never forgive you. But, but, but you when, the doctor, right, when the doctor turns on her, that's yeah. the last no, it's, line it's, of it's defense for her. It's certainly the plot of the movie which I suppose we've come this far it, in we this might as well. review yeah, I without into. mentioning it. And again, it's not spoilers because this movie's been out for 40 odd yeah, years. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, shame on you. You should probably have seen it by yeah. this point. Uh, is that a woman and her husband move into an apartment building. She immediately becomes pregnant. And uh, the tension builds as over the course of her pregnancy, she begins to suspect that her neighbors are a coven of witches and that her husband is collaborating with them in uh, having her, uh, you know, give birth to a child, which they're then going to sacrifice to the devil, uh, and the movie is a lot better than that sentence would ever make if, you believe. If yeah, if if you ever heard that there's a dream sequence where the devil literally rapes Mia Farrow, you'd probably picture something a lot schlockier than this movie is. Yeah. This movie is really well crafted; it takes its material very seriously, and I think that's where it succeeds. Yeah. Do you remember the first time you've seen this? 
I do, do, actually. Do, do you, did you know where it was going? Did you have an idea? It's, it's unfortunate that if you have never seen Rosemary's Baby, when you watch it now, whether you listen to us give you some spoilers in this review or not, yeah, sorry you won't that. be watching it for the first time. It's been out long enough and imitated and aped it's like frequently Psycho. enough that you can never watch it for the first time. Right. No. Right. Uh, and that's a real shame because the ending is such a gut punch. Especially... Even if you you really know where it's going. Yeah, it still resonates. It, it really yeah. hits you pretty and hard. And it's it walks such a line on a knife's edge between whether it's just about a woman having a psychotic breakdown mm -hmm. or whether there is something far more sinister going on in her life. Yeah. A lot of other movies try to do this. Recently Shutter Island. And we talked about this before. Yeah. I always assume I always thought Shutter Island would have been more interesting a movie if they didn't go spoilers for Shutter Island, if they didn't go the route of it just being a psychotic breakdown and if they went to any of the number of weird theories that went on like Nazi experimentation and stuff like that. Yeah, but the other thing is Apples and oranges, Shutter Island uh, like gets lost in having all these different subplots right. going on and one of the strengths of Rosemary's Baby is that it, Very it never loses this through yeah. line. There are maybe ten characters with speaking lines in the whole course of a, a fairly long movie. You know, and it, it never strays from them. It really never strays from Mia Farrow, who, no. again, is really incredible in this. She she looks as if she loses a ton of weight during the course of the movie. I don't right. think she did because crazy person <laughs> Christian Bale acting was not in vogue at the time <laughs> they made it. But she appears so breakable when right. you start this movie. And it's it's very interesting. I was thinking about it while rewatching it uh, last night. Um, Rosemary Howard is the youngest character by a significant degree in the whole movie. Uh, the, the devious, witchy, next-door neighbors are played by Ruth Gordon and uh, uh, a character whose name I forget. Uh, and our Ruth Gar Gordon, Gordon uh, received an Oscar yes. nomination. Uh, but very the, deservedly. She was one of the most entertaining characters yeah. ever. Uh, but they're, they're much older. They're, they're very sort of grandparent-like. Right. Uh, and e even her husband, played by John Cassavetes, is much older than her. So it, it really feels like a babe in the woods from frame one because you really want to protect her a right. lot during yeah. the course of the movie. And she has no one on her side by the end of it. And it's, it's really amazing. Uh, and actually, uh, you know, I've always been struck by... Uh, we were talking about, you know, the argument could be made this is the first new Hollywood picture. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's unintentional that the villains in the movie are all older characters trying to manipulate right. or work their right. will through much younger people. And I, I think there's a definite subtext of, you know, this is Polanski and Evans and, you know, the screenwriters sort of getting their dig in right. on, on these older studio heads who sort of, you know, like, this is how you make pictures, you know. And there's also a lot of comparison. We'll, we'll bring up, but we're also going to be reviewing The Exorcist, so stay yeah. tuned to that. There's a lot of comparison with that, too, in the idea that they're a youth kind of movement is the enemy to everybody around them. Yeah. Protagonist in the movie, but enemy to everybody around. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. I, I don't know if this came out before, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, same year. Bonnie and Clyde um, those would are both have been the big seminal later movies in the that, year, I think. Right, But, I right. mean, again, this is before Easy Riders. I mean, yeah. this is really early. Right. It's easy to forget because it feels very contemporary right. that things didn't break 100% for another year or two. Here's you know? a question, though. Here's a question. Everybody regards this movie, and instantly The Exorcist, which we'll talk about, as like cinematic masterpieces, mm -hmm. as true classics, true showcases to divine not only a genre, but what cinema can do. Yeah. Is it just me, or has horror just been not recognized as that anymore by mainstream, by pop culture. I mean, you horror is still insanely successful today. But is it like, can it ever be regarded the same again? I, I don't think we've really had many films, if any, since I'm, Rosemary's Baby. I'm sorry, I'm gonna call bull on okay. this. Because this movie is preceded, this is not the first horror movie no, I've made. No, it's certainly not. This preceded by 40 years of terrible B schlock. I, imagining that, like, you know, this was a time when horror was taken seriously. It was no, a time no, when no, all it wasn't. kinds of genre movies right. were taken seriously. Right, that's the that's and, the whole, that's the part of the whole movement and, of of the seventies. Uh, and uh, yes, we you know we've pigeonholed things a little bit in recent years. You know, it's but, it's hard to make 
a blockbuster horror picture. Uh, you know, there's been a no. It's easy to make a blockbuster horror it, picture. It's hard a, to make a well-regarded horror picture that will be nominated for Academy Award. There's been a trend recently. You get in really cheap. You don't spend any money on them, and you recoup something. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but I I don't think that's you know. I don't think that's a, a policy that's going to last forever. I hope not, but and it does seem like... Certainly, New Hollywood wasn't one right. that lasted or was sustainable forever that's true. either. You, you, could almost, you can almost say, that, like, from Rosemary's Baby to The Shining mm -hmm. in 1980 yeah. is where maybe it stopped. You know, that was the heyday of that period and where horror could be taken really seriously. Not just seriously, but just accepted in pop culture as something that is... That can be true art, I guess. In a way. That's the most highfalutin yeah. way you could ever say it. It is. Uh, all right. I'm so just the, curious. The yeah. strengths of Rosemary's Baby are definitely, it is incredibly well-paced. The score is something that will keep you up at night after the first couple times you watch it. Uh, Christoph Kameda, who'd worked with uh, Polanski a couple times before, did an incredible job on it. Um, the performances are out of this world. They're so mannered and so perfect, and, yeah. and uh, the script is unbelievable. I mean, everything about the movie is is really taken seriously, and, and not over-seriously, either. It's, it's yeah. never played too close to the vest. And there are definitely a lot of... There's a lot of interpreting that could be done with this movie. Yes, there is, which um, is one of the reasons, you know, it's had such a lasting appeal. Yeah. Um, I, I also have one last question before we, we go. Okay. Do you believe God oh exists in this movie? Oh. oh, my God. I knew that was coming. Oh, my God. All right. Just, we, this has been a point of contention, of contention for us. Not contention. Just an interesting topic that we've had for many years, uh, us being friendly. All right. I, well, here's the thing. Uh, for me, in the course of this movie, in the narrative of what we're shown on screen... We only ever see evil people. Yes. And we, we really, I mean, it's a Polanski movie. We never see an indication of any good in the world. And in fact, yes. there, there are many cutaways to a Time Magazine front page, which they manufactured uh, for the movie, uh, with the big byline, God is dead. On it. And it's meant to be a commentary about the apathy of the you know late 60s, early 70s. Right. I would make the argument that in in any of Polanski's movies, there is active evil, and then there is apathy. Yeah, and that is yeah. about as positive. I as completely he gets, agree. You know? I I'm usually the one that says, "Oh no, God is definitely in that movie." There is some kind of if there is a devil, there is yeah. a God. No, if there is, there's but Polanski no is positive, active. Oh good my God! Yeah, yeah, of yeah. and I, it's purely because it's Polanski. I also don't believe that there's a God in the worlds of ninth, uh, Gate. <laughs> Or, or really any of this other. Maybe yeah. Pianist, because Pianist is about hope and the struggle well, to survive. Well, if you want a horror <laughs> experience that is really going to stay with you, why not right. watch something that is unrepentantly negative in its <laughs> outlook? And God knows Rosemary and Baby is bleak. certainly that. Yes. Uh, so thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm. I'm Sam. I'm Andrew. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow.